Good morning. Morning. Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm the one up here in the funny clothes. Hello. My name is Jenny. And I'm kind of compare, MC, moderator for our session this morning called Shakespeare All Over. Uh, just before I introduce the other wonderful people on the stage here with me, can we see, because we're all lovers of Shakespeare up here, I know how many of you are already studying a Shakespeare play at school? Fantastic. Who's about to start studying some Shakespeare at school at the end of this year or next year? Next year? Yeah, year nines, put your hands up. Teacher says. Fantastic. Um, anybody seen a film of Shakespeare like Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet? Gorgeous. How many ladies here are 13 or 14 years of age? <laughs> Excellent. You would be married by now. No, Yay, wouldn't. they're saying. No, Fantastic. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Now we've stirred. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, today we're going to uh, introduce you to some of the world of Shakespeare and a little bit into the world of Romeo and Juliet. As I said, my name is Jenny. Joining me on stage is uh, lovely actor Amelia Bishop. Say hi, Amelia. Hello. Excellent. Amelia, come over this way. Also on stage, and I'm going to give you your official introductions now that are written down. Um, we have Tony Thompson, who is a writer, teacher, and musician. I'm sorry I stood in front of you. He's also worked as a grave digger. We might have to ask him about that afterwards, and a construction worker. Tony was on the selection committee that chose the English books for the VCE study. So you can boo him now. Boo. No. Yeah, good. Uh, as well as reading books, Tony also writes them. He's the author of a new novel, Summer of the Monsters, based on the early life of Mary Shelley, who wrote the story of Frankenstein. He's also written a biography, Shakespeare, the Most Famous Man in London. And that's the cover of the book, which you will want to seek out, teachers, because there's lots of good stuff in there. Also joining us on stage is Jackie French, who okay. is the Children's I Laureate for 2014 <laughs> to 2015, which is pretty astonishing. <laughs> Uh, she follows in the inspirational work of Alison Lester and Buri Monty Pryor. Jackie is a champion of books and reading, and you can find out more about Jackie's role as the uh, Children's Laureate at childrenslaureate.org.au. Jackie's written novels, picture books, history, and more. Some of her books have won national and international awards and sold millions of copies. Others were eaten by wombats, she says. She is a historian, ecologist, dyslexic, and a passionate worker for literacy and the right for all children to be able to read. And today we are looking at her wonderful book called I Am Juliet, which is her reimagining uh, through Juliet's eyes of the whole story of Romeo and Juliet. So would you please welcome the panel today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, you will have seen this wonderful thing up on the board here. We thought to get you kind of into the speaking of the language, we should do the best thing, which is to insult each other. Yes. Yeah? So what happens with the insult kit <clears throat> is that you take a word from one side, at one column, add it to the word in the next column, and then the final column, which is the noun. So we've got two adjectives and a noun. You can go straight across the line. You can mix them up. I need five volunteers. All right, you might want to stand back a little bit further. I'm going to figure out one. Oh, excellent. You have to say, thou art a, and I want you to really give it, yeah? So I'm going to look at you, and I'm going to say, thou art a beslubbering, Beef-witted barnacle. Oh, come on, give me one. Back. Come on. Thou art a, go for Thou it. Thou art a pribbling, hedge-born laudator. No. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? Take that. I am beautiful. beautiful. <laughs> can you hand the mic to somebody yes. else? You can go back and sit back down. This young gentleman has got one. Amelia, have you got an insult for this young gentleman? Yes. Thou art... An artless, fat kidnied flax wench. No. What's your answer to that? Come on, give it to us. 
<laughs> there are <laughs> there out a spongy what plume plucketed pig nut. Oh, oh. A pig nut. <laughs> a pig nut. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Pass the microphone to the young man. There you can sit down. Um, and Jackie, have you got an insult for this young lady here? There she is, there in the she lovely is. blue scarf. Okay. Eye of pig and nose of dog. Ooh. Hear thy fart breath boil and bubble. Ooh, she's made one up. She's a writer. Oh, no, no, no. That's, oh, that's, 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 that's the introduction. No, that is Shakespeare. That, ah, I know it is Shakespeare. That, that is ah, definitely, beautiful. That's definitely Shakespeare. Gorgeous. Never, you... ever, ever think those words in Shakespeare are nice. We just don't know what a lot of them mean. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Will you insult us back? Come on, give it Thou to us. Thou art saucy, rude, growing nut hook. <gasps> <laughs> oh, gorgeous. Can you hand the mic over? Tony, come here and there's a young man here that has annoyed you. I think you need This to... guy. Yeah, that this guy. guy. Yeah. This guy. Thou art a bootless, common kissing apple george. Oh. Ah. Yes, boom. Yeah, insult him. him back. How dare yes. we do that? <laughs> Thou frothy, full gorged harpy. Oh, nailed her. Ah, nailed her. Nailed her. <laughs> How did you know? You pass the microphone on this lady. Oh, I don't know that I like the look of her. I think you are. <laughs> thou art a mammering hedge born hugger mugger. <laughs> Take that. Come on. Give it to me. Thou art a bawdy... <gasps> bawdy? <laughs> Dread-bolted bladder. Bladder? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> She's saying things about my age now. Excellent. Um, Tony, would you insult... Can you give another insult? Well done. <laughs> would you insult one of these ladies and I'll get Jackie to insult the other lady. Amelia, so <laughs> yeah. Craven. Yeah. Crook-pated... Clack dish. Excellent. Can you say that a bit hot, louder for them? Okay. Yes, uh, we didn't hear you so much. <laughs> I can't yeah. remember what I Now, used. Arta. <laughs> a droning, dog-hearted death token. Ooh, <laughs> death token. <laughs> Come on. You're not going to take that. <laughs> Thou art a frothy, flat-mouthed foot licker. Oh, <laughs> take that, snaps. <laughs> oh, beautiful. <laughs> Can you take the microphone back over to there? Jackie, if you okay. want to insult for this young lady. Okay. Thou sluggard, rank, unweeded garden. Ooh. Things slime and pussy possess you merely. Ah, from Hamlet, that one, yeah. Patrick, yes. Ah, yeah, <laughs> so gorgeous, um, yes. Short sighted, I can't see. Ah, uh, yeah, if you stand back, if you stand in the aisleway just there, you can actually, you might oh, have to see. Oh, oh, would you oh, like come on, come and actually whisper some riggy, 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 horrendous <laughs> ones to you? Yes, yes. Come have, have a look, look there. on that one. There. Yeah. Okay. Once um, you've got one, turn around and give it to us full bore. Okay, oh, God. yes. How about pribbling, <sighs> puking? Yeah. Ah! Okay. Um, Stand back, Jackie. Thou art a pribbling, <gasps> ill-nutrid maggot pie. A <laughs> maggot pie? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really, really good, good call. call. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Please give Thank all you. our volunteers a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. So we are into, uh, into the language. Um, these Shakespeare, if you Google Shakespeare insult kit, you'll be able to, to find this on the web. It's a heap of fun. Um, and yeah, and after a while, you can end up making up your own insults, which is really delicious. <laughs> so to begin our session today, I'm going to ask uh, Tony, I'm going to hand over to Tony now, to tell us a little bit about um, Elizabethan London. You have some interesting facts. Hi. Now, the first thing is I'm Canadian, okay? So just when I start talking, don't go, what's, what's he talking about? Anyway, listen, the thing is, I don't know that much about Shakespeare. I know, I know that's disappointing because... I'm on this panel, but I did write a book about Shakespeare, and one of the things I found out while I was writing the book is that nobody, nobody knows anything about Shakespeare. A lot of people make up stuff, which is what I did. I made up the whole book. I just, it's a biography. It's in the nonfiction section of the bookstore, but I made the whole thing up because there's only about 
maybe five, six, seven facts about Shakespeare, and that's it, which is really weird when you think of it. I mean, this guy, there were a lot of plays floating around with his name on them, and everybody seemed to, I mean, he was a, he was a popular playwright, but nobody seemed to know the guy. Nobody ever wrote a letter saying, I know, dear Bob, you know, I had lunch with Shakespeare yesterday and he was telling me about his new play. Nothing, nothing like that. No diaries. Shakespeare didn't write any letters to anybody. It's, it's strange. It's really strange. And nobody knows the answer to it unless some like English guy goes up in his attic and finds, you know, 600, you know, in his 600 year old house and finds all these old letters or something. We're never going to know about this mystery. So this presented a considerable problem for me when I, when I started to write the book because <laughs> you don't write a biography of Shakespeare. What are you going to write about? There's only five or six facts. That's not even a page worth of material. So I was, I was in kind of a tricky position. I thought, what, what, can, I, what can I do? What can I, how, can I, how can I handle this? What can, I, what can I say about this guy? And I thought, well, okay, there's not a lot. There's no letters. There's no diaries, all the things historians normally use. But you know what there is? There's 36 plays with Shakespeare's name on them. And I thought, I'm going to look in the plays, and the plays are going to tell me what kind of guy Shakespeare was. Okay? So, who's studying a Shakespeare play? Which one are you guys studying? Merchant of Venice? What are you guys studying? Romeo and Juliet. Have you noticed about Romeo and Juliet that it kind of gets sold as a play about love? I remember my grade eight teacher, Miss Whitney, coming in with the play and saying, oh, children, this is a play about love. And then we started to read it, and there was just one fight after another in it. The whole thing, it's just a fight after fight after fight, and everybody gets killed. Have you noticed that Shakespeare's plays are really, really violent? Have you noticed that? They're violent. The Merchant of Venice, is, it's got some violent ideas in it, but, but that's not even the start of it. Titus Andronicus, a guy cuts his own hand off. It's terrible. And, and King Lear, a guy gets his eyes poked out, which is really ghastly, except one time I saw it perform with ping pong balls, and they were bouncing around. <laughs> and you know what? Ever since then, every time I see the play, I burst out laughing at that part, which is really inappropriate. But the, the thing is, is that the plays are violent. So I started thinking to myself, why, why are these plays so violent? Like, what kind of guy writes such scary plays? Think about Hamlet. At the end of Hamlet, Hamlet's like a horror, it's, it ends like a horror movie. Everybody's dead. Everybody's just dead on the stage. And there's, you know, there's one guy, you know, trying to get away. You know, it's just like Halloween or something. It's a terrible story. Richard III, it's a bloodbath. All of these plays. Macbeth's got a, like a ghost covered in blood in it. And I thought, man, this Shakespeare guy, was he crazy? Was he like a psychopath? Was he obsessed by violence? What was wrong with this guy? And then I thought, no, no, that's not it. Because a really crazy psychopath guy wouldn't write 36 plays that were so good. You know, <laughs> chain him up and write your plays now. No, I thought, that's not, that's not it. I thought the violence was there, but it probably wasn't inside Shakespeare. So I thought, where was it? If you want to know about somebody, like if you've got a crush on somebody and you want to know something about them, one of the things you can really quickly find out about somebody is, that, is where they live, like what neighborhood they come from. And yeah, <laughs> and then you can make all kinds of associations about what kind of person they are. I say, oh, I live in Footscray, and you guys go, you make, you, know, you make certain associations. So I thought, where did Shakespeare live? If I could find out about where Shakespeare lived, like if I could see, if I could see in my head Shakespeare's walk to work every day, I could get an idea of what kind of person he might have been, and I could write this book, and, and that would be great. So I, I started researching Shakespeare's London, and I found out the strangest thing about Shakespeare's London, and it just absolutely stopped me when I found out that in Shakespeare's London, everybody, students, dogs, cats, horses, babies, teachers, writers, everybody, all day, every day, drunk. Everybody was drunk in Shakespeare's London all the time. And why? Because they drank beer all day. If this was 1595, you guys would all have beer in your hands. I'd have a beer. 
Everybody drank beer all day. So why? Why? I say, was, Shakespeare, was Shakespeare's London like a party place? All right. They just partied all day. No, no, that wasn't it, of course. Like people went to work and stuff. I mean, they weren't, they weren't like smashed. They were just tipsy, a little bit drunk because they were drinking beer all day. Why were they drinking beer all day? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, they couldn't drink the water. That's, sometimes I really have to drag that one out of audiences. So very good. They couldn't drink the water. The water was, you know, and they didn't know. They didn't know how to purify the water, right? They, they didn't know what all you guys know. Even Shakespeare, the smartest guy in the whole world, didn't know that if you boil water, you can drink it. He just didn't know that. But they noticed that when they drank beer, they didn't die. So they drank beer instead of water. Because if you drank water, you wouldn't just get sick. You're gone. You're dead by lunchtime. That's it. Because it was the Thames River, and everyone threw all their junk in there. I mean, you still wouldn't want to drink water out of that thing. But anyway, so this is what happened. I, I thought to myself, okay, everybody's a bit drunk. So what happens in a, in a crowded city full of drunk people? What's Shakespeare seeing? What's, what's Shakespeare, what's he walking through on the way to work? What's he living with every day? And I thought, what do drunk people do? Drunk people do a lot of things. I'm not going to tell you about all of them, of course. <laughs> but I will tell you about a couple of them. The first thing that drunk people do, mildly drunk people, is they sing, right? They love to sing. That's what karaoke is all about. Drunk people singing, someone gives them the words. So everybody in Shakespeare's time was walking around singing. They didn't have iPods, of course. So they would, and Shakespeare's plays have a lot of music in it. We kind of ignore that part of them now, but that was a big draw for Shakespeare's audiences. They could see live bands and they could hear music. And they couldn't, there was no recorded music, so they would buy the words and they'd learn them and sing them. So it was drunk people walking around singing. And I thought, oh, well, <laughs> that doesn't really explain people cutting off their own hands or getting their eyes poked out, does it? You know, it, it doesn't really sound that bad. It sounds kind of nice. But then I found out this other thing, or I realized this other thing, I guess, that the other thing that drunk people do, what are they, what's the other thing that drunk people do? Yeah, you've, <laughs> gee, you always get, audiences get that really quickly. They fight, because the little part of your brain that says, that guy just bumped into you, he's not like your mortal enemy, this isn't the invasion of Czechoslovakia, just let it go, that shuts down. So when somebody bumps into you, push them back, and, and, he, and I thought, oh, okay, okay, so drunk people fight, they're singing, but they also fight. So now I'm getting closer to the kind of place Shakespeare might have lived. I hope that you guys have never seen drunk people fight, and I hope you never do. But if you do, this is what it's going to look like. Right? It's not, it's not like in the movies, right? It's like really stupid. Nobody knows how to do it properly. And, and I thought, you know what? Big deal. Bunch of drunk people throwing half, you know, ridiculous punches at each other. That does not explain anything, and it doesn't tell me why the plays are so violent. But then I realized this other thing. So the really important fact, there were no cops. There were no cops and there were no banks. So people had to carry all their stuff with them all the time, all their money. So all the money they had, they'd carry usually in a purse right around here somewhere. And everybody knew that everybody was carrying all their money with them. So, and there were criminal gangs in London. It was a crowded you know, city and these, these gangs would come up and they'd rob people. It was a dangerous place. So what did people do? Well, they armed themselves. <laughs> you see where this is going? They all carried swords, and they carried knives in here and in their boots, and they carried blackjacks, and they carried knuckle dusters, and anything they could carry. These people were weighed down by weapons, just in case someone came up and said, give me your gold. So now I think, oh, oh, <laughs> it's, I've got it. It's a city full of drunk people with concealed weapons. That's a bad combination. That's a really bad combination. So I guess what happened at that point was I said, oh, I see, this is a really violent city. So Romeo and Juliet, yes, it's set in Verona, but this is, this is Shakespeare's London. This is what you're seeing in that play. Sure, it's about love and, you know, whatever, conflict, all the things, you know, the big ideas that go up on the whiteboard at school, but but it's also a guy writing about the place that he lived in. And one thing is, I'll just finish with this. One thing, if you're not, some of you probably a little bit not sure about Shakespeare, the language and the big ideas and all that kind of thing. The trick to Shakespeare is recognizing that this was a real person 
who lived in a real city, okay? And he, went, he walked to work through this every day, and he put on the stage what he thought people would recognize. So if you can sort of, when you're reading it, try to see the real guy in there and the real experience, I think you'll enjoy the plays a lot more. And that's what I'll leave you with. All right, thanks. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we are now going to, just before Jackie speaks, uh, we've created a little piece of performance from her, her book, um, I Am Juliet. And in this reimagined version of Shakespeare's play, we actually see the events of the whole play through the eyes of the 13-year-old Juliet. As I said to you guys, 13 and 14, you would be married um, in Shakespeare's England. There's a wonderful mix uh, in this book of both Shakespeare's text and also contemporary writing. And, she's bringing, and Jackie brings this story alive for you new readers. Here we meet Juliet at the big party that she has had to celebrate her coming of age and a feast to welcome the county Paris, the man who has come to negotiate marriage with her and her father. But Juliet has always dreamed that one day she will meet a man who truly loves her. And she has just danced with a stranger. A stranger that has captivated her heart, looked at her with love and desire, just like in her dreams. This is I Am Juliet. Then have my sin, the lips that they have to give me my sin again. Oh, oh, my lady Juliet, your mother is very pleased. The county Paris is very impressed with this gathering. Your mother, oh, you look just like a grown-up lady. Your mother has said, I have wished for such a daughter, and I have her now. Oh, there will be a betrothal ring this summer. I cannot marry the earl now. What will my mother say when I refuse him? What will my father think of his daughter choosing a man to love? Oh, my lady Juliet, are you ill, my sweet? No, good nurse, but I would like some wine or ale to drink. Ah, well, stay here. I will fetch it for you. Oh, your cheeks are hot. <laughs> my stranger. Who is he? Where is he? I do not even know if he lives here in Verona. The rubies on his fingers, his fashionable rapier, and his bearing will tell me he is wealthy. It doesn't matter. Anyone here can tell him who I am. He will come to the house tomorrow to seek my father's leave to court me. Father will find out his family and estate. Perhaps he has royal connections like the Earl of Paris. Where are you, my dark-eyed love? There, by the door, leaving, without a farewell. <laughs> Nurse. Yeah. Oh, yes, what is it? Who is that young gentleman? Oh, the one with the silver stocking tops. Oh, that's the son and heir to old Tiberio. Who is he that is now going out the door? Oh, with the eagle plume in his hat. Oh, young Patricio. No, the man who follows him who didn't dance. I do not know. Go, ask his name. If he is married, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. What Go! What do you mean? She looks grim. Her news is bad. His name is Romeo and a Montague, the only son of your greatest enemy. A Montague? That cannot be. My only love sprung from my only hate. Too early seen, unknown, and known too late. What's this? A rhyme I learned from someone that I danced with. Oh. It was not a lie, for we danced our own dance in the shadows, he and I. Oh, well, you can come away. The strangers are all gone. Gone? He will never be gone from my heart. But he is a Montague. How can a Capulet love a Montague? Who am I? 
Who is Juliet if not the dutiful daughter who loves and hates where she is told? Come away. Your father is very pleased and so is the county Paris. Are you not as well? What do you feel? I, I know not what I feel. Oh, come. Is it only a few hours since I walked this way? I was a girl then. I'm a woman now. Love was a word to me, a dream. Love was not for Juliet Capulet. And now it is life itself. He's a Montague. Come, come, my sweet, take your rest. Oh, oh my aching boat. Oh, oh. Has there ever been a day as long as this? His name is Romeo and a Montague. Was he the Montague that Tybalt spied? Was that why Tybalt stormed from the hall? If my father had known there was a Montague in his banquet hall, why had he not thrown him out? Perhaps he knows that not everyone that wears the name of Montague is evil. Is the hatred between our houses a game that adults play? Well, I will play my parents' game of hatred no longer. I have heard his name before. Now I remember. A cousin once said, Romeo is a good lad for a Montague. Tybalt has never boasted of fighting with Romeo Montague. No one has ever laughed at the air of Montague lying drunk in the streets or brawling at the city gates. No, if there had been bad to tell, someone would have told it. I cannot marry the Earl of Paris now. My loyalty to Capulet vanishes with the torchlight. I've been used, played as a chess piece, played for a marriage. Now I am myself, not theirs, just Juliet. Are you sleeping out there, my love? How can two names keep us apart? Romeo, Romeo, give up your name. It is only your name that is my enemy. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose would smell as sweet with any other name. Throw away your name, and for that name, take all myself. The end. Jackie French. <laughs> the bloody head thudded over my garden wall at midnight. I had never seen a severed head before. I had never seen a dead body. Dead bodies belong to the world of men beyond my garden wall. This is a play written where girls might be whores, they might be nurses, they might be wives, they might be bar wenches, but mostly they were daughters and they were wives, and that was all. But for a few years, just a very few years, towards the end of Queen Elizabeth I's reign, Shakespeare was able to write a play where a girl made the running, a girl proposes marriage, a girl is the centre of the play and does the unthinkable. She chooses her love and she proposes to him and she is the one who proposes marriage to Romeo and plots the entire book. But a few years after that, Queen Elizabeth died, and from then on, almost until today, people have played Juliet as this sweet, innocent maiden, but even more importantly, they have forgotten she was 13. 13-year-old 13 girls, in fact, 
did not marry in Shakespeare's time. Um, royalty might be betrothed even at six months old or ten years old, but the average age for a girl to marry in Shakespeare's London was 18. The average age for a man to marry was 27 because you needed to actually be established in your career before you could afford to marry. So this is a play where a 13-year-old girl is shown on stage with her teenage husband in bed. Today, this would be illegal to be shown on television. You cannot show a 13-year-old girl in a sexual scene on TV or on the stage. Juliet was only 13. Is there anyone here who has been in love? <laughs> yes. Is there anyone here who believes in love at first sight? Okay. <laughs> um, don't rely on it, but I fell in love with my husband, not at first sight, but at second sight. I saw him walk up the steps to our garden, and I knew that this was the man I would spend the rest of my life with until death us do part. And even though it took a year for me to be sure of that, I was right, and so was he. My brother met the woman he has now been married to for nearly 45 years. And again, it was love at first sight. Don't rely on love at first sight. But yes, it happens. This is a book about sex, about violence, but it is also about love and courage, extraordinary courage. This is about two young people who refuse to accept the stupidity of their elders. Two young people who realize that for no reason anyone can remember, their families are enemies. And they have the courage to say, we will not be our parents, we will not be our families, we are going to change not just our own destiny, but the destiny of the city. Because that is something too that we forget when we read the play. There is a prince in this book, and the prince was the ruler of the city. The prince wanted peace and the enmity between the Capulets and the Montagues to finish. All they had to do was marry and get to the prince, and there would have been a happy ever after. This was not the plot of a stupid girl. This was not the plot of a desperate girl. This was a very resolute, intelligent young woman who realized that if she could marry the boy that she loved, the prince would support their union and she would change the history of her city. And she almost made it. This extraordinary, incredible heroine, Juliet. And yet in the centuries after that, theatre producers, people who have taught it, um, have played her as being this sweet, simpering little miss that things happened to, but she was not. This is probably the stroppiest, most courageous woman in the history of theatre. And in a very real sense, she did not die. The bit I'm going to read now is the words of possibly the first person to ever play Juliet. And the actor was a young boy, a very young boy. He would have been sold to Shakespeare's troupe um, back then with the plague. With, with, there were famines um, because of the plague. Often crops couldn't be bought in. It was a desperate time. This boy was probably sold to Shakespeare's troupe at the age of eight or nine or ten. And until his beard started to grow, until his voice broke, he would be given girls' parts. And it didn't matter that he couldn't act, because after all, what use is a girl? 
a girl would only be given a few lines. Ah, doesn't matter. Dress yourself up in gorgeous costumes and no one is going to pay any attention to you. But he suddenly realises, given this part, he is the major player and he is terrified because he has never even dreamed he would be given a major part in a play. Jam lay in bloody puddles on the stage. Rob stood behind the curtain, waiting to go on. Terror bit him, gluing his silk slippers to the floor. And suddenly, she was there, or she was him, or he was her. It didn't matter. Somehow, his feet became her feet. She glided onto the stage, her face downcast, her eyes glancing obediently at her mother. And all at once, he understood what Simon had told him during his first week with the company. Words are all very well, boy. But a true actor can bring the crowd to tears without a word. That is our mystery, lad. The playwright puts down the words, but the audience that watches... They're ours. You're mine, Rob thought. For these few moments, every lady, gentleman, servant or apprentice here belongs to me and to her as well. For Juliet was with him. Somewhere, sometime, there had been a girl. Perhaps her name was even Juliet. It was her strength that drew in those gazes. And she was here today in the words that he would say, in his every gesture, in their minds, pleading for love to triumph over enmity. And you will weep for me, Rob thought, each one of you. Even you men sitting straight as broomsticks, so your neighbours don't see your tears. Every day till you are dust. You will remember how you watched a young girl die in front of you for love. There will be no actor in your memory, no theatre and no stage. Just the girl, the aching of her tears, the tears you shed for her and for me. She did not die, cannot die as long as actors tread the stage. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, she soars above your webs of hate. Today and in your memory forevermore, I am Juliet. For anyone who has ever loved, for anyone who has ever felt caught up in the senseless webs of hate or other people, this is the play that will speak to you and will give you courage. And yes, it is in the language of hundreds of years ago. Read it the first time and skim through it. And forget about the bits that are difficult. Read to the heart of the play, to the girl and to that message from so many hundred years ago. That message which will not die. And the second time, perhaps, read it for the words. Because once you get over the old-fashioned language, the words as well as the message are beautiful. Thank you. Um, We've got, Questions? do we want yeah. to bring chairs up or stand? You tell me. No, nope, stand, yeah, we'll stand, stand happily. Stand is fine. We've got okay. about four minutes <laughs> before the session Sorry. finishes. The session's so short. Um, we'd like to throw open to you guys if you'd like any, to ask any questions about Shakespeare, or question of Jackie, question of Tony. Anybody got a question they feel they would like to ask? Everyone is going, oh, we can go early to lunch, miss. <laughs> yeah? Yes, there's a question yes. here. So um, question, probably, sorry, just to repeat the question um, so people was have that. There, was there any truth in the Romeo and Juliet, Juliet story? Yes, probably. 
Um, there was um, at least one play beforehand in English, um, written about 10 years before this one. Um, but there are many, many other references, and the earliest one found actually claimed um, it was based on a true story. And so, yes, I think probably. And in fact, I think her name probably was, if not Juliet, um, a variant of that name. Um, and I think it was probably a variant of Romeo. Um, we can't know for certain, but it is very likely that, yes, um, there was a Juliet. There's, um, and even today, the little balconies outside of windows on houses, usually on the first floor, is known as a Juliet balcony. Yes. It's actually called that now, which I think is really interesting. The other thing, too, of course, Shakespeare is a writer. He'd read um, at school, studied a lot of kind of um, the metamorphosis stories of Ovid and a number of different kind of stories. And so a lot of his plays were based on stories that kind of went back to myths and those sorts of things as well. So as well as bringing real life, as Tony said, the life he was seeing around in the streets, he had those knowledge of ancient stories as well to bring to it. Um, other questions? Any other questions? There's a kind of half little hand up at the very back there, and there's a lady in a scarf. Can you pause? We'll see who gets the microphone first. There's okay. a microphone coming towards you. The young gentleman, would you ask out your question? Um. Would all the actors be males, including, like, the minors, like the nurses? Yep, yep. Um, they, they were all males. Um, again, most of the female roles, the young female roles, um, were played by boys. Um, but even the older ones, the nurse, again, would have, would have been an older, older bloke. And there are even references to sometimes that actually um, Lady Watson had forgotten to shave that morning, so you might see her moustache or, or her beard. It wasn't until King Charles II... Um, allowed females on stage, and that was a scandal. There was also, uh, but we can't talk about that now because it's far too shocking. But there's, um, <laughs> it's great to. In France, they had more women on the stage, but in England, they did keep it as an all male company. The, Sha the Globe Theatre in Shakespeare uh, in London, the recreation, they still do productions every so often that have completely male casts. They have done an all female cast of one as well. Our Lady in the Scarf, she wanted to ask a question. Um, Jackie, have you considered making I Am Juliet into a film? Ah. <laughs> um, Why? No, you the I, um, I do the book. Um, other people offer me options to turn things into films. So it's not up to me. It's, it's actually up to someone to say, hey, would you like me to make your book into a film? But as it's only been out for about 10 days, um, that, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> so there are hot off the presses. Um, yeah, yes. It... <laughs> what were the five or six facts you found out? You know, every Tony? time I say that, I think, why did I say that? <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing. I mean, the facts that we do know about Shakespeare are, well, they're kind of banal to tell you the truth. We know like things like he was born because there's a birth certificate, right? He got married. He got married to a woman called Anne Hathaway. Who was pregnant. Not that one, though. Not the... Not we, the we, not. we also know that he got married very, very quickly um, yeah. and that she was pregnant and older than him. And also um, that shows here where um, Romeo was able to get a marriage license the next day. Shakespeare really knew how to get a marriage license very quickly and... Secretly. And he died. He, he had he, to do it. <laughs> and, he and, and he died. Yes. Apparently. That's uh, three. Wait, wait, that's three. Pretty, okay. And he went sure to London. Died. Yeah. Uh, he was involved in a legal case uh, <laughs> quite late in his career. And he, 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 you know, he signed something. He lent some money to his son-in-law. And, and so he, every time he signed his name, he spelled it a different way. Is anybody bad at spelling in here? Because yep, yep. you're living in the wrong century. Because in Shakespeare's time, you could just make it up as you went along. Spelling was optional. And you know which way he never spelt it? The way we spell it. The way we spell it. There you go. So he, those are the five facts. And, and he also left his second best bed to his wife, which is absolutely fascinating. But they now say the second best bed was actually the best one to sleep on, so that was actually a good thing. 
Um, we, ladies Maybe. and gentlemen, we have run out of time. I'm getting a time signal from the lovely Alex up the top there. Uh, but before you all run and jump up to run away, uh, if you've got any quick questions you want to come down and ask us, please do. But would you please thank Tony Thompson, Jackie Frank, okay, Mary Bishop. <laughs> I'm Jenny Lovell. Get the books. Get the plays. Read thank them. You. Have fun. <laughs> Talk, speak them out loud. Thank you very and much.